In part one of this series about mind control, we went into a lot of foundational history about the weapon known as the television. In big subjects, I try to be thorough, giving you enough background information so that people can really have a grasp on what it is that we're actually dealing with. The only reason for this series is to help those who desire to wake up out of the strong delusion. I believe that if you can clearly see how it is you have been guided and steered, it allows you to have enough strength and conviction to get off that path and choose what and who truly matters, and that is Yahuwah. So we are talking about how we got into this mind control in the first place. It's important. In part one, we saw that in 1950, only 9% of American households had a television set. But by 1960, the figure had reached 90%. In just a decade, this piece of technology was in 90% of homes in America, at least one set. The peak ownership percentage of households with at least one television set occurred during the 1996-97 season with 98.4% ownership. That's almost 100%. The TV went from being in one room to many rooms to now, fast forward through time, it's traveling with us wherever we go through the use of smartphones. In the United States, as of 2022, there are approximately 307 million smartphone users. 85% of American adults use a smartphone, and even our young children from as small as one year old have their own personal device to watch content on their mobile television. So their reach went from 1% of homes in 1948 having one television set in their homes, to now, in our current times, 85% of all individual adults having a personal television set in their hand. Do you remember this scene in Back to the Future? Our first television set. Dad just picked it up today. Do you have a television? Well, yeah, you know, we have two of them. Wow, you must be rich. Oh, honey, he's teasing you. Nobody has two television sets. <laughs> they only had one television set. But now 85% of individuals in this country, and data shows that 85.88% of the world's population own a smartphone. So it's not just the United States. A majority of the world uses a smartphone. We have these individual personal television sets in our possession for a majority of the hours while we're awake, with average screen time averaging around six to eight hours per day. If you follow the evolution of this and what was actually done, it is not hard to see the mind control that was engaged against the population that has brought us to this very world that we live in right now. And so if we're going to understand how deep and serious this all is, we need to get back in this conversation and discuss the history of the generation that was pretty much the guinea pigs to all the mind control. We're going to discuss the baby boomers and mind control. Let's begin. Okay, so if you're a part of my generation, which is probably a mix between Generation X, which is born around 1965 to 1980, and the millennial generation, which is people born between 1981 to 1996. That's the mix. If you're from my generation, that means that you had parents that were born in the baby boomer generation. And if that's the case, you might recognize that our parents' generation can be very hard to talk to and communicate controversial thoughts and opinions to. It was hard for me to come to this understanding at first because their rejection often comes with either extreme pride or complete shutting down to facts or thoughts that are too deep for them to even handle. Very early on, as I was waking up, I came to realize that a majority of the problems that I had and the mind control that I was under was completely due to my parents' generation. At first, in my mind, I initially blamed them for being so weak. But as I began to study this problem, I began to feel bad for them, which is why I tried so hard to reach them. But like I said, they are very hard to talk to. This generation that I'm referring to are the baby boomer generation. This generation is often defined as people born from 1946 to 1964, during the mid-20th century baby boom after World War II. When I look back at all the problems we deal with in this world, this generation were definitely the guinea pigs that contributed to the majority of this mess. And unfortunately, they are the hardest to wake up, maybe only second to their parents. But their parents, which would be my grandparents' generation, many of your great-grandparents, Though they are mind controlled, they still aren't as mind controlled as the baby boomers, but they're still stubborn, proud, and set in their ways due to time. So they're not interested in learning anything new from my generation or anybody younger. But their children, 
The baby boomers, they are the first major group that was mind controlled. And it is them that we must start with if we're going to understand where we are today. This baby boomer generation, like I said, they're very hard to talk to today and they hold distinct mindsets that keep them trapped. I praise Yah that there are a few from that generation that watch these videos and they have woken up, but they are by far a minority set within their generation. Now the reasons, they're pretty obvious once we examine this subject in full. The reason's simple. They have been under the mind control programming the longest, and therefore it is harder for them to be awakened from it. Their life was started at the beginning of this mental warfare, and they only look back at much of it with happy memories of nostalgia because times were much better than they are today. And they will tell you that you just had to be there. And listen, to anyone from that generation that's watching this, I am not judging you. Unless your family was grounded in truth and not influenced by the plethora of sellouts, then not being a part of this mind control would be very difficult. I mean, today, my father, he still holds a grudge about his neighbors or members of his parents' church when they were there in Jamaica who told his parents that they needed to get rid of the radio that they brought home. They warned his parents that the radio was giving an entryway for the devil. And as we see today, they were right. But at that time, the majority would not see it in this way. And the type of entertainment that they started with, it probably didn't seem so dangerous. So it is understandable how many of you got caught up in the mind control. But be clear, just because we understand the challenges, it doesn't give you a pass to stay trapped and mentally controlled. And if you're going to be ready for what's coming, you need to wake up. You need to peep the game and come out of the mind control programming. So I'm going to break it down. Let's look at the period when the television just started entering the homes. The 1950s. This was right after World War II. Let's look at what changed or happened after World War II. The world saw the formation of the United Nations the World Bank, the IMF, the creation of Israel, the formation of NATO, detonation of the first nuclear bomb, communist China rises. And that's just a few events, just to name a few. And none of that was televised how it is today. Now, people might have heard of it on the radio or they saw it at the movies, but it was nowhere close to the exposure they were going to have later when those televisions came into the homes. So before these television sets came into the home, the leaders of the world, they created a lot of organizations and things that were fundamental and foundational to the world that we live in today. But they were just created after the war and the general public, they didn't really know the ins and outs of it. They just heard about these things. So later on, when they begin to see these organizations on their televisions, they only had a feeling of trust and loyalty in them. There was no reason for them to doubt them. After World War II, the United States was the main winner and declared the new leader of the world. So there was a strong sense of patriotism in the United States. The United States was the world's strongest military power. Its economy was booming and the fruits of all that prosperity brought new cars, suburban houses, and a lot of other consumer goods. It was a whole new world. More was available to more people than ever before. After World War II ended, many Americans were eager to have children because they were now confident that the future that they went to war for was now here for them. They had a future that promised peace and prosperity. And so they came back home to establish themselves. The government created a GI Bill that subsidized low-cost mortgages for many returning soldiers, which meant that it was often cheaper to buy one of the newer homes in the suburbs than it was to rent an apartment in the city. And now, a page from our Sunday morning almanac, June 22, 1944, 70 years ago today. The day Americans fighting in World War II what a victory far from the battlefield. For that was the day President Franklin Roosevelt signed the Servicemen's Readjustment Act, otherwise known as the GI Bill of Rights. Although the war still had just over a year to run, the government wanted to assure opportunities for returning men and women in uniform. The GI Bill promised World War II vets a raft of benefits outlined in special films, starting with help finding right employment. If they can't find you a job right away, you'll be given $20 a week up to a limit of 52 weeks. Relatively big money for the time, believe it or not, as was the educational assistance for GIs looking to go to college. The government pays all of your school bills up to $500 a year and living expenses of $50 a month or $75 a month if you have dependents. In 1947, 
nearly half the college admissions in the United States were veterans studying under the GI Bill. And then there was the help the legislation offered to vets hoping to get a loan for their very first home, a benefit one film went to rather dubious lengths to showcase. Uh, but wait a second. What about the beautiful blonde? Don't tell me the GI Bill of Rights guarantees every returning serviceman one of those, too. No, that's still up to the veteran, just as it's up to him to take advantage of the GI Bill of Rights. All told, nearly 8 million returning vets did take advantage of one or another of the GI Bill's real benefits. Benefits that helped shape post-war America for decades to come. And this is how people started moving to the suburbs. This is an example of the steering and control through economics. They didn't know it was happening like this, but through economics, if things make better sense financially, you just go with it. And what they were getting was a better value for the buck in the first place. The GI Bill helped white Americans prosper and accumulate wealth in the post-war years. Now, it is important to note that this prosperity did not happen the same for the Negro veterans. In fact, the wide disparity in the bill's implementation ended up driving growing gaps in wealth, education, and civil rights between white and black Americans. In 1944, at the height of World War II, the United States made a major investment in the nation's social safety net, aimed at boosting education and promoting upward mobility. Commonly known as the GI Bill of Rights, the program sought to integrate 16 million veterans returning from World War II back into civilian life. But like many of the governmental systems put in place during the Jim Crow era, the GI Bill, in practice, systematically excluded most African Americans. The GI Bill had the potential to put the American people on a level playing field. But black soldiers who came back, who were prepared and anxious to get higher education and buy homes, were not able to ascend into the middle class the same way that whites were. In practice, African Americans had very, very little opportunity to use the GI benefits uh, that uh, the GI Bill provided throughout the South. In the North, it was somewhat better. African Americans never gained that wealth, and therefore the effects of that policy still perpetuate the inequality of today. In a statement to NBC News, the VA admits the disparities, but it says they're working to bridge the gap. The Negroes have been fighting against racial discrimination for centuries. During the 1950s, however, the struggle against racism and segregation entered the mainstream of American life. For example, in 1954, in the landmark Brown vs. Board of Education case, the Supreme Court declared that separate educational facilities for black children were inherently unequal. The movie with Denzel Washington, Remember the Titans, it gives a fairly decent recollection of what was going on at that time. Many Southern whites resisted the Brown ruling. They withdrew their children from public schools and enrolled them in all-white segregation academies. And they used violence and intimidation to prevent the Negroes from asserting their rights. In 1956, more than 100 Southern congressmen even signed a Southern manifesto declaring that they would do all they could to defend segregation. This is just the backdrop to the times in American history. You have to understand the country at that time if you're going to understand the mind control that took place. Now let me say this. There was definitely already mind control happening at the time leading up to all this. I'm not saying that the 1950s was the start of mind control. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that after the television came into the picture, the mind control was much stronger and effective and ready to grow and steer the new generations away from societal norms held for millennia, thousands of years. Up to this point, the roles within the family unit were not changed. Even though women started to work during World War II, when the war ended, life began to go back to societal norms of millennia's past. And there was also still segregation, racism, and inequality. These were all prevalent in that society. It's said that during this time in the 1950s, there was a sense of uniformity that was strong within American society. Conformity was common, as young and old alike followed the group norms rather than striking out on their own. Even though men and women were forced into new employment patterns during World War II, once the war was over, the traditional roles in a family were reaffirmed. 
Men were expected to be the breadwinners. Women, even when they worked, assumed their proper place was at the home. I mean, this was a common statement. Even the president, JFK, said this. The women are used as effectively as they can to provide a better life for our, our people, in addition to meeting their primary responsibility, which is in the home. That was over 60 years ago. If he said that today, he would have been canceled. I just want you to think about that. Like I said, in the 1950s, the nuclear family was the norm and consisted of a young husband who more than likely was a war veteran and his wife who had settled into their suburban tract house and had begun to add to the family that they had started the previous decade. In 1947, a record 3.8 million American babies had been born. Throughout the 1950s, the United States population increased from 150 million to 179 million. By 1958, children 15 years old and younger constituted almost one third of the United States population. There was a baby boom. That's why they're called the baby boom generation. But like I said, during that time, there was conformity. It was common. All Americans, whether from the city, the suburb, or the small town, were expected to look a certain way and neatly fit into the mainstream. That's why when you look back at everything, everybody was wearing the same type of clothing, suits, and they all looked the same. It was common. The husbands and fathers were the breadwinners, while the wives and the mothers stayed at home. They cleaned the houses, cooked the meals, and raised the children. Teens and young adults dated and went steady, which was a prerequisite to becoming engaged. They were expected to marry, start families, and assume the same domestic roles as their elders. Now, though the television sets were not in the homes yet, there were Hollywood movies that people went to. And so there was a lot of programming done by the movies and through the radio. For instance, women didn't just get back into the roles without mental coaching. The roles women were expected to assume were depicted in the era's Hollywood movies. Films produced during the World War II portrayed women as active participants in the war effort by heroically toiling on assembly lines or in combat situations supporting their husbands. We must call upon women. All over the United States, women are called upon to leave their homes and take jobs. Among our young unmarried women and among older women whose children are grown, we have a large reserve. They discover that factory work is usually no more difficult than housework. Employers find that women can do many jobs as well as men. Some jobs better. Tens of thousands of women are already at work in aircraft. More are being added as fast as they apply. This solves the breadwinning problem for many families whose men are at war. The government's policy is that women should get the same pay that men get for similar work. Where necessary, machinery... And then later, after the war, into the 1950s, countless films featured clear messages for women. The message was, if you are female and you want to fit into society, your primary role will be that of a wife, mother, and a feminine object. In these movies, professional women were shown to be like unnatural and unfeminine. Usually, they were also unhappy. Happiness came from turning away from the coldness of the working world to embrace the life of the 1950s woman at home. That was the mental programming during those times to get women back into the homes. Be clear, this message wasn't directly given in words, but it was just how the women were depicted. The movies were not about this, but they provided an image that people wanted to follow. In countless post-war films, the popular female characters were in stressful situations, such as a murder mystery or a venture drama, and they were depicted as being totally helpless and in need of rescue by a handsome, strong-leading man. Think about Cinderella and think about Snow White. This was the same programming in different ways in the adult movies. Now, so I can help you understand this, I need to backtrack a moment and introduce this man to you. I've spoken about him in other videos, but if I do not bring him up, things may be lost. The man is Edward Bernays, who is known as the father of modern public relations. Although during that time, most Americans never heard of this man, he had a profound impact on everything from the products they purchased to the places they visited to the foods that they ate for breakfast. He was the man more than any other who got women to smoke, and he was the one who put bacon and eggs on the breakfast tables. He worked for dozens of major American corporations, including Procter & Gamble and General Electric. Also worked for government agencies, politicians, and nonprofit organizations. 
Bernays was named one of the 100 most influential Americans of the 20th century by Life magazine, and most people didn't even know he existed. Think about that. I bring him up because his major influence was during the period of 1919 to 1963, and he styled himself a public relations counsel. He was responsible for moving people the way his clients wanted them to be moved. While disapproving of women who smoked, men began to take up smoking in increasing numbers, partly because a flood of advertisements in what was America's newest mass medium, national magazines, made smoking attractive. These ads evoked the symbolic values many men already associated with cigarettes, sexual appeal, sophistication, pleasure. But they failed to persuade women to risk the disapproval of their menfolk by taking up cigarettes. Even George Washington Hill, the advertising genius who made Lucky Strikes America's best-selling cigarettes, couldn't figure out how to break through the social barriers that kept women from smoking. So he turned to a public relations genius, Edward Bernays. He said, we have a problem. We're losing half the market in America because there is a taboo against women, women smoking particularly smoking in the streets. He said, I want your help on that. So I said, before I can offer you a, a suggestion or a recommendation, I would like your authority to visit Dr. A. A. Brill, who was the leading psychoanalyst of his time. So I went to Dr. Brill and I said, can you tell me what cigarettes mean to women? And as quick as that, he said, cigarettes to women are torches of freedom that they use to dramatize their objection to the taboo against smoking by men. And then he added as an afterthought, and they titillate the erogenous zones of the lips. So I left and wondered what to do with that information. And I decided we would get debutantes to light torches of freedom in the Easter parade to protest man's inhumanity to women by the taboo against smoking. Within six weeks, smoking became an accepted pattern for women throughout the United States. An ancient prejudice has been removed. Today, legally, politically, and socially, womanhood stands in her true light. American intelligence has cast aside the ancient prejudice that held her to be inferior. Depending on the campaign, his tactics would differ, but his philosophy in each case was the same. Hired to sell a product or service, he instead sold whole new ways of behaving, which appeared obscure, but over time reached huge rewards for his clients and redefined the very texture of American life. Think about how everyone back in that time was smoking cigarettes. A whole new thing. You think they were just doing that because they just wanted to smoke cigarettes? This was programming. This man redefined the very texture of American life. He was responsible for showing the influencers of the world how they can manipulate and steer the population. In his 1928 book called Propaganda, he writes, The conscious and intelligent manipulation of the organized habits and opinions of the masses is an important element in democratic society. Those who manipulate this unseen mechanism of society constitute an invisible government, which is the true ruling power of our country. We are governed. Our minds are molded. Our tastes formed. Our ideas suggested, largely by men we have never heard of. This is a logical result of the way in which our democratic society is organized. Vast numbers of human beings must cooperate in this manner if they are to live together as a smoothly functioning society. In almost every act of our daily lives, whether in the sphere of politics or business, in our social conduct or our ethical thinking, we are dominated by the relatively small number of persons. 
who understand the mental processes and social patterns of the masses. It is they who pull the wires which control the public mind. See that? What I'm trying to say here is that mind control is real. And this man was the first most widely known person to do it. So I brought him up because I'm bringing up the indirect influence from the movies in the 1950s. And maybe your cognitive dissonance might want to tell you, oh, it's just a coincidence. But listen, it was not. These people make content that indirectly influenced the generations to be what they wanted them to be. So after World War II and the building of America as the leader of the world, they conditioned the women to go back and start families and go back to traditional roles. And that's what I'm getting at right here. What I want to do is mark this point in the 1950s as the beginning point, because, because at this point right here, everything was normal. This was the period when the trust in the government and corporations was set. And so this generation, they were all for the taking. But here's the thing. The influence wasn't just made for the adults, but it was actually mainly for their children, who will be the leaders for the new world that was forming. During this time, adolescents by the millions started to embrace rock and roll, a new liberating music style with artists like Elvis becoming a major influence, making Negro music popular in white America because a white man was singing it. All of a sudden, black Americans began demanding equal rights. This was the backdrop to the 1950s. And if you don't understand what the world was like, you won't see how we were all directed to change. By the 1960s, these rumblings exploded to a full-blown cultural revolution. Just a decade. It was spurred on by the coming of age of the baby boomer generation. This generation began questioning everything, from racism and sexism in, in American society to the government's foreign policy. They started to question everything. A small percentage of Americans in the 1950s had an individual television set in their home. But by the 1960s, it was almost at 90%. But it's not like it is today. There were not a multitude of channels. There was only three networks, ABC, NBC, and CBS. And so the American audience all around the country by the 1960s, even though the television was in most of their homes, they were all watching the same programming. The television was a family device in which the whole family would watch it together. So I want you to just imagine and understand that by the 1960s, after the baby boomer generation began to be born, televisions were now in a majority of homes in America, and 90% of the American public was receiving the same program. That's why there was a collective consciousness. And what's also important to understand about the power of television is that we're all watching the same thing. There are only a couple of networks uh, that are broadcasting the same shows, and so there is a kind of a collective consciousness that Americans are buying into. Everyone was being programmed to accept and feel the same way. They were all under the same spell. In the late 1950s, eight of the top 10 programs were Westerns, and half of the top 30 shows are set in the mid-1800s. This was called the golden age of the Western genre. These Westerns stressed unity in the face of danger and the ability to survive in hostile environments. It was easy marketing and adaption for people who liked these kind of shows. But programming, designed specifically for that baby boomer child, began to emerge with shows such as Captain Kangaroo, Romper Room, Howdy Doody, and the Mickey Mouse Club. They had content that was directly made for them. But even though it's a birthday, we still must pledge allegiance to the flag. Friends at home, are you all ready? Put your right hand over your heart and nice outside voices. That's it, Ralph. Very good. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Programs that adults watched, like Leave it to Beaver. Leave it to Beaver was a show that everyone watched, but it was told from the point of view of a child because they were talking to the children. Let me not get ahead of myself. Let's jump into the decade of change. The 1960s. The 1960-61 to 61 television season was the beginning of the end for the TV Western. And it's when the mind control power of the television was put to use in great lengths. We're going to review the different points of mind control that occurred. The first major change was politically. In September of 1960, the Nixon-Kennedy debate was the first televised presidential debate. This was the time where the American public were all influenced for the first time at the same time all together. 
the country was widely introduced to John F. Kennedy for the first time. They weren't just hearing his speeches on the radio or seeing him if he came to their town. He was in everyone's home all at once. The television became an important medium to meet our leaders. So it was much more than just listening. By seeing them, they could attach to them, and they did so with JFK. Now, I will get into this later with Michael, but we cannot ignore what was happening with Michael when examining politics. I call him Michael because that was his original name. Please don't get distracted by that. We cannot ignore what he was doing. Along with being introduced to JFK, Michael King was a very popular Negro. He was the most influential Negro at that time, and he was getting a lot of media attention through the civil rights movement. Okay, we got that. We'll talk more about that later. Now, please know there was already a beginning split between Negroes who voted Democrat versus Republicans. But today we know the Democratic Party gets 90% of the Negro vote. This period right here is when the start of it happened. If you want to understand how 90% of the Negroes began to vote Democrat, this is how it happened. It began with political theater. Just a few weeks before the presidential election between John F. Kennedy and Nixon, Michael King got arrested with others during a sit-in in Atlanta. But while everyone else was released, Michael King was kept in jail. On October 26, John F. Kennedy called Michael's wife, Coretta, to express his concern. And then 24 hours after that call, his brother Robert called the judge and asked that he get King out of jail. Then Michael's Prince Hall daddy, Michael Sr., the one who changed both their names, he was a longtime influential voting Republican. He already endorsed Republican candidate Nixon. But then he came out publicly and said, I was against having a Catholic for president, but if he can wipe the tears from my daughter-in-law's eyes, I have the courage to vote for Kennedy for president. And I have a suitcase full of votes. And so this influential Negro Republican endorsed the Democratic nominee. And then when Michael got out of prison, October 27th, he was interviewed on television by reporters. John Kennedy and Richard Nixon did not differ much in their moderate support for civil rights. Both candidates also looked to the White South for votes. But civil rights did become a campaign issue when Martin Luther King was arrested at a student sit-in in Atlanta. King, sentenced to four months hard labor, enraged the black community. Kennedy and Nixon were still wary of losing Southern white votes and avoided making public statements. But privately, Kennedy and his staff felt they had to take action. There's Martin Luther King sitting in a county jail and Kennedy wanted to do something, to say something. Finally, they, we, some of us had the idea that Kennedy might just call Mrs. King and express his sympathy and tell her what he was doing to get King out of jail. He said, I'm thinking about you and your husband, and I know this must be very difficult for you. If there's anything I can do to be of help, I want you to please feel free to call on me. And I didn't quite know what to say except to thank him and say, well, I really appreciate this. And if there is anything that you can do, I would uh, deeply appreciate it. And then that very night, Robert Kennedy called the judge in Georgia and called him to get that judge to get King out of jail. The Kennedy phone calls proved to be a smart political move. The next day, King was released on bail. On the Sunday before election day, Black ministers around the country endorsed Kennedy from their pulpits. It was to be one of the closest elections in American history, with John Kennedy winning by less than two-thirds of 1% of the popular vote. And they say this course of events, this phone call made by Kennedy, was said to be the turning point in one of the closest elections in modern history at that time. Kennedy beat Nixon because he got more of the Negro vote through political, highly orchestrated theater. This all happened on television, and so 90% of the home saw this and believed in the authenticity of it. There was no reason to doubt any of this. The public knew very little of Freemasonry and the Boulay membership of Michael. They didn't even know there was a Boulay. They just saw their black leader wrongly in prison, and it was this Democrat who cared enough to get him out. The power of the television brought the last Negroes over to the Democratic Party, and they were all attached to Kennedy. Okay, so they were introduced to Kennedy in 1960 by the television. And then three years later, he was assassinated. I want you to understand this. The whole country was brought up in hope, watching his inauguration. 
and then they were traumatized collectively as they watched him be assassinated. This happened to the whole country all at the same time. Imagine it. This was the first time the nation attached to a president over the television, and then he was killed. The whole country was traumatized. It was one of those major events similar to 9-11 that everyone in the country was watching and listening to. They were programmed to love this man. And then they were traumatized and they were taken captive for three days straight. Nielsen, the leading provider of television audience data, measured the percentage of United States television homes with their sets on in the period from November 22nd to the 25th, 1963. 45.4% of American homes with a television, a total of 51.3 million homes, had their sets turned on at 2.45 p.m. on November 22nd when the White House confirmed President Kennedy's death. Let's analyze it deeper. You know in this country how they say you're innocent until proven guilty? Well, if you hear the case presented about Oswald, he was declared guilty and the media made it so. The evidence was clearly circumstantial, but the leader said he did it on television, they showed the gun, they showed the room, and then they said he visited Russia, and the public just agreed that he was guilty. Naturally, if I work in that building, yes, sir. Back up, man. The power of the television was being displayed. The whole country was following the same programming and having the same collective consciousness. They watched it all together. Listen to these statistics. 65.8% of the homes with televisions had their sets in use at 6.15 p.m. on November 22nd as the new president, Lyndon Johnson, was speaking to the American people following his return to Washington. 47.2% of United States television homes had their sets on at 12.30 p.m. on November 24th, moments after Jack Ruby shot and killed Lee Harvey Oswald on live TV as he was walking through the basement of the Dallas police headquarters. 81% of United States television homes had the television sets on as they carried Kennedy's body at Arlington National Cemetery. This is the biggest audience of that four-day period, according to Nielsen, at 3 p.m. on November 25th. During those three days, at least half the homes in America were watching the play-by-play, -play, and 80% of the homes watched them carry the body. This was massive mental control, and so depending on what was being said by the commentators and the journalists, the American public was just eating it all up at the same time. You have to imagine journalists on air speaking whatever they were allowed and guided to say by those who controlled those networks. Whatever the public was meant to feel, they had full access to the minds of the people and they used it effectively. The country was traumatized and they were guided through this trauma through the television. You can never look at the baby boomer and their parents without understanding this trauma that they probably don't even recognize they were affected by. So that was through politics which was all about their control and leadership, along with their thought that their vote made a difference. Let's look at the next change through television. The rise of television journalism. Understand, a lot of these points they intersect, but they all have different points of thought for the mental control programs. Before the television, people listened to the radio and they read the newspaper. Both were successful in getting stories out, but full control of a narrative was not possible until the television. In the 1960s, television brought powerful pictures of global and local happening to the home. It became a medium able to deliver news, share public opinion, and unite people in the great moments. After Kennedy was elected, the power of the television was known. And being that it was in the large majority of homes, people began to rely on TV news for the day's headlines, as well as information on American troops in Vietnam, particularly the numbers of those killed or wounded. Films of battlefield activity in Vietnam, as well as photographs, interviews, and casualty reports were broadcast daily from the centers of conflict into the American living rooms. When something major happened on television, it affected the whole country at the same exact time. The civil rights era, the JFK assassination, and the space race all unfolded right before everyone's eyes on television. You have to understand that all these things were happening all at the same time to a ripe audience that was just being introduced to this new technology. Look at all these events. The Kennedy presidency, 1961. 
August 28th, 1963, the Walk on Washington and Michael King's I Have a Dream speech televised. November 22nd, 1963, the Kennedy assassination. The Civil Rights Act signed July 2nd, 1964. Malcolm X assassinated February 21st, 1965. Michael King assassinated April 4th, 1968. Robert Kennedy assassinated June 6th, 1968. Look at all these things that happened all at this time. This was the leadership of their generation all killed and it was all televised and they just got the television. There was a building up of hope and then there was despair. But the youth, they were not left alone. They were told to keep hope alive and the new generation of leadership was then arising. But the point that I'm making is that all of these events, when all this was happening, people went to find out what was happening from the television now. And so whoever was in charge of making the news and reported it now had access to over 90% of America and they were able to tell 90% of America what they wanted them to know and what they wanted them to think. Now this needs to be said. Maybe you're a devil's advocate and you believe that not everyone is evil and sinister and just because they had access and control of these people's minds, it doesn't mean that they were lying to them. Well, first thing I want to be made clear is that if this is your view, this video is not the one made to prove that point to you. This video is for those who watch my Strong Delusion video and recognize that magnitude of lies we were born into and they want to come out of it. But also, let me be clear that in part one of this series, I went over the power and control of who controls the business of this industry. The same people who have declared with their own mouth their desire for a new world, they have controlled and steered this world to obtain this goal. In other videos, I have broken down Freemasonry, Prince Hall Freemasonry, the Boule, the Black Greek Letter Organizations. I made a great deal of content explaining the power behind the scenes. So maybe you want to play the devil's advocate and it's because you either haven't been exposed to all this information, in which I suggest you take the time to do so, or no matter what, you want to believe in the world that says there has been no conspiracy against the minds of the world. And even though there is a small amount of people with power, that still doesn't mean that they will use their power for evil. Even though many of the movies you've seen with a supervillain was a rich, powerful person with a plan to take over the world. I mean, listen, that's your business what you want to believe. But I am showing you the power the television had and how it changed the world starting with the baby boomer generation. Let me continue. Another point I want you to understand about the news is that previously the robber barons were not a secret in the generations before the baby boomers. Those generations were either called the Silent Generation or the GI Generation. Standard Oil, the Rockefellers, J.P. Morgan, Carnegie, all these men and their influence was in the papers. They did much of their business right out in the open. It wasn't until TV news that their influence and power went behind the scenes in curtains. They hid themselves as the unseen hand. They were no longer in the news and the reporters did not speak about them personally. We only heard about their corporations in which the baby boomer generation did not even know that these men and their families controlled them. And I believe this theory was tested and proved in 1960, 1964, and 1968 when Nelson Rockefeller ran for president. The most popular Republican candidate with the American people, Nelson Rockefeller has been coming up from behind in the race for his own party's nomination. In the first six weeks of his campaign, he traveled to 20 states, even while he carried on the tough job of governor of New York during the crucial last days of a legislative session. This man of power was right in their faces and the public only knew what they were allowed to know about him. I mean, he was governor of New York for a long time. You see, this is mind control and the power of television. The public only knew what they were allowed to know. This is the beginning of how minds were held captive. This is the power of television news. On July 20th, 1969, was when the moon landing was televised. An estimated 600 million people across the world tuned in to watch this event live on television, including almost the entirety of the United States. There were only three television stations in 1969, ABC, CBS, and NBC. You know this. And their respective moon landing broadcasts were watched by a combined 93% of American households. I want you to imagine a whole population of a country doing the exact same thing at the same moment, watching the same thing, hearing the same thing. There was no denying that the world wasn't a globe that we could fly out of. The whole public saw this with their own eyes. But we know today that this event didn't even really happen. 
I'm not even sure how much I can even say about that. They even tell it to us in our movies. Correct. Explaining how the Apollo missions were fake to bankrupt the Soviet Union. You don't believe it went to the moon? I believe it was a brilliant piece of propaganda that the Soviets bankrupted themselves, pouring resources into rockets and other useless machines. This was an actual movie. It was used as great propaganda, and you don't have to dig that far to see this. So knowing that at that time they were lying, just to imagine close to 100% of this population of people watching and believing a lie that they still don't recognize was a lie. From the Oval Office, President Nixon watches along with 600 million people worldwide. We copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. Biggest TV audience ever at that time. On July 20th, the world sees the first men, Americans, walk on the moon. Neil and Buzz. From the White House, the president congratulates the astronauts. I just can't tell you how proud we all are of what you have done. For every American, this has to be the proudest day of our lives. The promise John Kennedy made at the start of the decade has been fulfilled. It's hard not to see how manipulated these people were. This was happening like this for over a decade. Families all around the country gathered in their living rooms, around their television sets, to all take in the same program. Again, just imagine 90% of the population at home at specific times taking in exactly what has been told of them to believe. There was no countering it. There were no opposing opinions like we have today. The television was the trusted source. They were never informed of the potential dangers of it. Just like today, after a decade or more of using the iPhone, now Apple wants to come out with a warning of using it. But the people are already hooked. The warning's not helping now. The people were instantly hooked and had immediate trust in this technology and were completely unaware of the potential risk and consequences. So as these things unfolded and news journalists told them the stories, they had no reason to believe that they ran the risk of being lied to or that they were being herded. But yet, undeniably, they were. So please understand, it may be frustrating, I know, but if you have ever tried to discuss the news with your parents or grandparents and you have come up short and you don't understand why they believe everything the news tells them, it's because they were trained to believe it. It really is an odd relationship because they were trained to rebel against the status quo and fight against what they feel is wrong. They were trained to question their government, but they were not trained to question the television and the news. They grew up under the influence of this new media and had strong trust in it from the beginning. So it would be more uncommon than common for them to just disagree with the news media as a whole. They just feel they need to find the side that understands their views. And that's why they just float to either MSNBC or Fox, because the difference in opinions or who is lying and telling the truth to them, to them, it really depends on the politics and it's not about the news media as a whole. If the politics are off, they're lying. But if they're not off, they're being told the truth. This is how they feel. This is how they're trained. So if you're trying to reach them, you have to come at them another way than just trying to get them to go against the news. They are literally mentally trapped in a feeling of trust that needs to be diminished before they listen to the younger generation, which they feel really doesn't understand. I hope that makes sense. Let me continue. Now, the next part of change is a real big deal. It deals with the civil rights agenda along with the women's rights agenda. And so I have to split this content up into two parts. It was important that much of this information was given in order to set the stage for this understanding, but I do not want to overwhelm you. So I have split up the content so that it gives you time to digest and review because I know these videos are long. Listen, I understand and know that it's not an easy thing going against the wiles of the devil. And so I want you to remember that you must be strong in the master and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of Elohim that you may be able to stand against the walls of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. 
Therefore, take up the whole armor of Elohim that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. That's Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 13. You see, as we break all this down, please do not forget that though these things are being waged in the flesh and you can see these attacks personally, please do not ever forget the spiritual nature of what is going on. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in Elohim for bringing down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of Elohim, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Messiah. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3-5. So listen, please keep Yah at the center of your thoughts and continue to bring your thoughts into obedience of Him. This is a great deal of information that I'm presenting, and I'm trying to see the best way of presenting this, so I've split it up, like I said, into two parts. The next part dealing with the civil rights and women's rights. And please trust, all that information, it needs to be dealt with separately in order to not make a two-hour video in which I lose you and you miss other points. So I had to split it up. Y'all willing, the next part to the series will come out next week. But after this information is all done, it will all be in a playlist that can be followed video by video. I do not want to overwhelm, and I also want there to be time to digest what is actually being said. So I'm praying to Yah about the best way to accomplish this all. Please be patient with me, and I do appreciate your feedback if you have any. Please remember, as I said in the first video, these thoughts that we all have, they must be analyzed and reviewed. And the more you see other people's influence in your mind, the more I pray it gives you strength to scrutinize all these thoughts and bring them into captivity to the obedience of Messiah. We are in the last days, and if you're going to be ready for Yah's kingdom, you must not be in that strong delusion. As you wait between these videos, please make sure you take the personal time to reintroduce yourself to Yahuwah through his word and cast down all strongholds in the name of Yahusha. I have a spiritual warfare prayer in the description box that I pray helps you. It's time to wake up and fight for your mind. Do it through the power of our Messiah and let his truth set you free. Be blessed. Hallelujah. Praise Yah. Okay. So listen, thanks again for watching. If this has blessed you, please make sure to like it and share this video with others. If you haven't done so already, please make sure you subscribe to this channel. Yah willing, I upload every Friday. Please make sure to follow this ministry on Facebook and Instagram, as well as on my website, truthunedited.com. If for any reason you no longer see this channel on YouTube, you can always find me on my website. I again want to thank everyone who is sowing into this ministry. I feel humbled by this assignment Yahweh has given me, and your support truly blesses this ministry. I thank you for assisting me with carrying out and serving him. I am truly grateful for you. You know who you are. Be blessed. Okay, everyone. Thanks again for watching. I love you all.